Welcome back. In today's video, we are going to discuss about the anatomy of female pelvic organs. In this video, we will be dealing with external genitalia and internal genitalia. In the next session, urethra, urinary bladder and pelvic ureter. In the third session, rectum, anal canal, pelvic muscles and pelvic floors, fascia, cellular tissues, ligaments and the applied anatomy. External genitalia and internal genitalia. External genital organs, the synonym is vulva or the pudenda. It comprises of the mons pubis, labia majora, labia minora, clitoris, vestibule. Internal genital organs are vagina, uterus, fallopian tube and ovaries. So we'll be dealing about each one of these parts in detail in the upcoming slides. Starting with the external genitalia, the synonym is vulva or the pudenda. The vulva will include the mons veneris, labia majora, labia minora, clitoris, vestibule and conventionally the perineum. These all are visible on the external examination. Therefore, they are bounded anteriorly by the mons veneris, and laterally we have the labia majora and posteriorly the perineum. Now you can see in the picture here, we have this uh, large openings which is labia majora and then we have the inner openings, the foldings. These are the foldings, okay? Labia majora are the large folds. Then we have minora, which are the minor folds, skin folds. And then uh, there are two openings. One is urethral opening and the larger one is the vaginal opening. Then you can see the clitoris here, the urethral opening. And again, the same thing is given, okay? Starting with mons veneris or mons pubis, it is the pad of the subcutaneous adipose connective tissue. You can see the pads of the tissue which is present on the, the pubic bones, which is present on the pubic bones. It is subcutaneous adipose connective tissue. It is lying in front of the pubis and in the adults, it is covered by the hair. Now, this is the mons veneris. It is a adip connective tissue, connective adipose tissue. This uh, adipose connective tissue is containing hairs in the females, adult female, okay? Then we have the labia majora. The vulva is bounded on either side by the elevation of the skin and the subcutaneous tissue which forms the labia majora. So guys, you have to focus on this point here. In the labia majora, we have the elevation of the skin plus subcutaneous tissue we have skin plus subcutaneous tissue and it is forming the labia majora on either side it is bounding like this they are continuous from uh, continuous and they join medially to form the posterior commissure so guys you can see here this is labia majora then they are joining posteriorly and they are forming the posterior commissure in the next slides in the picture you can make out Okay, here what did they say? This is the labia majus. See, you can see labia majus is the other term for labia majora. This labia majora is fusing. This labia majora, okay, this is labia majora. This labia majora is fusing downwards and here it is forming the posterior forchette. You can see here the forchette, okay. This is the posterior forchet. The labia majora is covered with squamous epithelium and it is containing the sebaceous glands, sweat glands, hair follicles. So you can see uh, this labia majora, if you take a cross section of the skin there, you can see the hair follicles, sweat glands and sebaceous glands show you this is the sweat gland duct okay the sweat glands then we have the sebaceous glands here the sebaceous gland 
and we have the skin uh, that is the hair follicle the beneath the skin there is connective tissue and adipose tissue the below the skin you can see the adipose tissue connective tissue okay which is the adipose tissue and connective tissue the adipose tissue is richly supplied by the venous plexus and any injury to this uh, site will produce the hematoma and the injury is occurring usually during the childbirth this adipose tissue is being supplied by the blood vessels okay by the venous plexus this veins and any injury to the site will produce profuse hemorrhage the labia majora they are homologous with the scrotum in the male the round ligament will terminate at its anterior third now in the next slide when we study the other homologous structures i'll show you uh, this labia majora in the males it is uh, homologous to the scrotum in the males and you can see the round ligament terminating in the anterior third of the labia majora then we move on to the next part of the external genitalia labia minora labia minora are the two thick folds of the skin so you can see here uh, labia minora there is only skin it is devoid of fat no fat okay in the labia minora it's only skin it is on either side just within the labia majora so we have the labia majora this labia majora is containing skin plus adipose tissue whereas this labia minora which is bounded externally by the labia majora it is present inside and it is containing only skin and it is bounded either side by the labia majora except in the paris women they are only exposed when the labia majora are separated so you can see uh, people who have not born any children that is nulli paris the typical virgins you cannot see the labia minora in them uh, whereas in the paris women they are exposed just like that okay only when you move the majora you can see the labia minora in the nulli paris anteriorly they are divided to enclose the clitoris so you can see here the labia minora anteriorly it is enclosing the clitoris this minus continuing and it is enclosing the clitoris and it is uniting with either side in the front and the behind the clitoris to form the prepuce and the frenulum you can see the clitoris anteriorly it is joining to form the prepuce and posteriorly there is frenulum now you can see in the picture here this labia minora it is extending like this uh, this labia minora extending and it is enclosing the clitoris this uh, this small portion uh, this small portion is the clitoris and anti there is frenulum and also prepuce on the upper part there is prepuce i'll i'll show you like this okay this is the clitoris and this labia minora is covering the clitoris there is prepuce on the top and this is the clitoris okay this is prepuce and there is frenulum the lower portion of the labia minora the lower portion of the labia minora it is uh, fusing in the midline to form the skin fold it is fortunate again this labia minora is also fusing in the uh, like uh, in the midline and it is forming the fortunate this is also injured during the childbirth you can see this fortunate this is also being formed by the uniting of the two labia minora in the midline between the fortunate and the vaginal orifice is the fossa navicularis now you can see the fossa navicularis this is not given in the picture between this forchette and the vaginal orifice you can see the forchette here and the vaginal uh, orifice here between this forchette and the vaginal orifice lies the fossa navicularis oh it's given here this fossa navicularis you can see with the help of this this is the forchette this is the vaginal opening so between this forchette and the vaginal opening between these two we have the structure called for uh, fossa navicularis the labia minora does not contain the hair follicles the folds will contain the connective tissue 
numerous sebaceous glands again here we have the connective tissue sebaceous glands erectile muscle fibers and numerous vessels and nerve endings so guys you there is no hair follicle rest the things like the sebaceous glands are present numerous vessels nerve endings connective tissue and erectile muscle fiber is present here it is homologous to the ventral aspect of the penis so you can see the fossa navicularis in the um, males it is homologous to the fossa navicularis in the females it is present on the ventral aspect of the penis moving on to the next part that is clitoris it is a small cylindrical erectile body this clitoris is a cylindrical erectile body it is measuring about 2.5 centimeters it is situated in the most anterior part of the vulva you can see uh, you can see the uh, clitoris here it is about 2.5 centimeters and in the anterior part of the vulva it contains a glans a body and two crura now you can see a glans the two this is the glans and this is crura and a body okay moving on oh okay the glans is covered by the squamous epithelium now you saw the glans here this glans is being covered with the squamous epithelium and it is richly supplied with the nerves the vessels of the clitoris are connected with the vestibular bulb now you can see this glans is connected uh, is supplied with the nerves whereas the vessels are connected to the bulb okay and then uh, it is connected with the vestibular bulb and they are liable to be injured during the childbirth even the vessels of the clitoris are injured during the childbirth so, so there is so much injury uh, chances of injury during the childbirth to all these parts the vessels of the clitoris which are uh, connected with the bulb vestibular bulb are liable to the injury the clitoris is analog to the penis in the male so what are they comparing the clitoris to it is analogous with the penis in the males but it will dis differ basically in being entirely separate from the urethra whereas uh, this uh, penis will be connected obviously there is a connection there is single opening in the uh, males for the urethra and the sec uh, secretions so whereas in the females there are different openings so this clitoris is differing from the males because of the separation in the urethra it is attached to the under surface of the symphysis pubis by the suspensory ligament now you see this clitoris here it is being attached to the under surface of the symphysis pubis by the suspensory ligament you can see this ligament here and this is the clitoris it is being attached to the symphysis pubis by the suspensory ligament okay suspensory ligament of the clitoris moving on uh okay vestibule vestibule is a triangular space bounded anteriorly by the clitoris posteriorly by the forchet on either side by the labium minus okay so we have uh, the clitoris in the front so this vestibule this triangular space anteriorly we have on the side we have the clitoris posteriorly the labia majora labium minus and then they are uh, joining in the midline and they are forming this forchet on either side we have the labia minora okay and this triangular opening which is given here is the vestibule there are four openings present in the vestibule so we know the two openings let us see the other two openings here the two openings are vaginal and urethral the new ones are the skinny's duct and the bartholin's gland the openings of skinny's duct and bartholin's gland you can see in the picture here we have the urethral opening then we have the vaginal opening these two openings are done the next openings are skinny's gland opening and we have the bartholin's gland opening this is the bartholin's gland and these bartholin's gland opening will be there in the vestibule okay moving on urethral opening the opening is situated in the midline just in front of the vaginal orifice guys we saw here just in front of the uh, just in front of the vaginal opening we have the urethral opening just in the front okay 
and it is about 1 to 1.5 centimeters below the pubic arch. The paraurethral ducts will open on the either of the posterior wall of urethral orifice or the paraurethral ducts can open directly into the vestibule. So uh, in this urethral opening we have the ducts okay the urethral paraurethral ducts where do they open either in the uh, this orifice posterior wall of the orifice or they open directly into the vestibule we know the vestibule bonded and uh, superiorly and all this we saw in the previous slide so either they can open in the posterior wall or directly the paraurethral ducts can open into the vestibule vaginal orifice and the hymen Vaginal orifice lies in the posterior end of the vestibule and the varying sizes and shapes of the vaginal orifices and the hymen can be observed. In the virgins or the nulli para, the opening that is the vaginal orifice opening is being closed by the labia minora but whereas in the Paris women it will be exposed. It will be incompletely closed by a septum of the mucous membrane and this septum of mucous membrane is nothing but the hymen. The vaginal orifice being incompletely closed by a septum of mucous membrane. This incomplete closure is, by, uh, is nothing but the hymen. Okay. Then you can see the various uh, shapes and sizes of hymen, annular hymen, we have the cribriform hymen, septate hymen, in the Paris women the hymen being completely exposed, the vaginal orifice or imperforate, there is no opening at all, okay, there is no vaginal opening, these are the different types of hymen, so we have an idea about it. Now we, move on, now we move on, the membrane will vary in the shape but it is usually circular or crescentric in the virgins. You can see in the virgins it is going to be circular or crescentric. The hymen is ruptured at the uh, consumption of the marriage. Obviously after the person gets married the hymen ruptures. During the childbirth the hymen is extremely lacerated. This uh, lacerated hymen could be of the varying sizes. And they can present in the form of cicatrized nodules. This, okay, see, this is the, so you can see this is a hymen. This hymen being ruptured and forming a small nodule-like, cicatrized nodule formation because of the laceration. And then these uh, nodules of the various sizes are nothing but caranculae myritiforms. Caranculae my reti forms on both the sides it is lined by the stratified squamous epithelium so these hymen on both sides is lined by the squam stratified squamous epithelium moving on to the next thing that is bartholin's gland bartholin's gland are situated in the superficial perineal pouch they are close to the posterior end of vestibular bulb okay now you can see this uh, this is the great vestibular bulb. Below the vestibular bulb, we have the Bartholin's gland. Okay. This vestibular bulb, they are close to the posterior end of vestibular bulb. You saw in the thing. This is the vestibular bulb. This is the posterior end of the bulb. Okay. Then uh, below the posterior end of the bowl, uh, bulb, we saw the Bartholin's gland. They are pea-sized. Uh, pea and they are about 0.5 cm. Uh, the size of the Bartholin's gland is about 0.5 cm. And they are yellowish white in color. You can see in the picture. Okay. They are being yellowish white in color. Posterior to the vestibular bulb. During sexual excitement, it secretes abundant alkaline mucus which helps in lubrication. So, the Bartholin's glands are going to secrete the mucus which is helping in lubrication. The contraction of the bulbocavernosis will help to squeeze the secretion. So, here you can see the bulbocavernosis muscle, the squeezing the contraction of these muscles will help to squeeze this uh, um, bulb and it will result in the secretion.
the contraction will help to squeeze the secretions and these glands are composed of the racemose variety this bartholin's gland are composed of the racemose variety and they are lined by columnar epithelium the gland has a duct which measures about 2 cm now you can see the duct here and this is the gland and the size of the duct is 2 cm and it is opening in the vestibule you can see very clearly here the duct of the bartholin's gland opening in the vestibule outside the hymen at the junction of the anterior two-third and posterior one-third of a groove between the hymen and labrum minus so it is opening in a groove between the hymen and the labia minora so this bartholin's glands duct is opening in a groove which is present between the hymen and labia mi minora the duct is lined by the columnar epithelium so you can see here uh, this is the duct this duct is lined by the columnar epithelium then moving on near its opening it is by the stratified squamous epithelium near the opening the uh, the cells structure is changing type is changing and it is becoming into the stratified squamous epithelium from the columnar type you getting it so you can see in the picture here the columnar epithelium changing into the stratified columnar uh, squamous epithelium in its opening bartholin's gland will correspond to the bulbo urethral gland in the male you can see this bulbo urethral gland which is present in the male similar structure and this is the bartholin's gland in the females a very clear picture now you can have this picture in your mind forever bartholin's gland okay the duct measuring about two centimeter opening in a groove between the labia minora and what did we see the hymen vestibular bulbs now we move on to the vestibular bulbs they are bilaterally elongated masses of erectile tissues so guys uh, we have seen in the picture these bulbs okay uh, in this picture you can different uh, you, you can know where exactly it is being placed okay these vestibular bulbs we are going to discuss about these vestibular bulbs are bilateral they are elongated masses of erectile tissue they are situated beneath the mucous membrane of the vestibule so you can you saw there it is situated in the uh, mucous membrane of the vestibule each bulb is lying on the either side of the vaginal orifice and in front of the bartholin's gland so guys uh, from so many slides we are very clear of this this is the bulb okay beneath the bulb is the bartholin's gland so each bulb is lying on the either uh, this is the vaginal orifice on either side we have the bulbs this is the bulb this is the bulb this is the bulb on the either side of the vaginal orifice is the bartholin's gland and it is incorporated with the cavernosus muscle so it's very clear the bulbs and then now you can see in the picture here the bulb of the vestibule the bulb of the vestibule two bilateral bulbs and in center there is vaginal opening on either sides we have the vestibular bulb then they are enclosed with the copper uh, corpus cavernosus muscle okay the cavernosus muscle is going to enclose them they are homologous to the single bulb of the penis and corpus spongiosum in the male now you can see here the corpus spongiosum uh, since it is an erectile tissue even the bulbs in the females is a elongated masses of erectile tissue so they are homologous with the corpus spongiosums in the male they are likely to be injured during the childbirth so this uh, bulbs vestibular bulbs are also likely to be injured during the childbirth the blood supply of the bulbs they come from the internal and external pudendal arteries so the, we are talking the blood supply of the internal genital organs it is from the sorry external genital organs it is from the internal as well as external pudendal arteries the blood will drain through the corresponding veins the lymphatic uh, drainage is into the inguinal lymph nodes and also the internal iliac lymph nodes 
Nerve supply is from the branches of the pudendal nerve. We have the pudendal arteries, pudendal nerves and then the anterior part. Now you can see the anterior part is being supplied by the genitofemoral nerve and posterior inferior part is by the pudendal branches from the posterior cutaneous nerve of the thigh. The pudendal branches from the pudendal branches from the posterior cutaneous nerves of the thigh. The vulva is supplied by the labial and perineal branches again of the pudendal nerves. Okay, vulva also by the pudendal nerve. But the branches are differing here. So you have to remember nerve supply by the pudendal nerve, anterior part by the genitofemoral nerve, posterior inferior part by the pudendal branches of the cutaneous nerves of thigh. Whereas the vulva is supplied again by the pudendal nerve. So, we are done with the external genital organs, mons pubis, labia majora, minora, clitoris, vestibule. Now, we will be discussing about the internal genital organs that is vagina, continuing with the uterus, fallopian tubes and the ovaries. Oh, so there is some, okay. What's wrong with this? Okay. So, we have the vagina and everything. Starting with the vagina. Vagina is a fibromus uh, fibromusculomembranous. So, guys, you can see here. It is fibromusculomembranous sheath. It is communicating with the uterine cavity, uterus, with the exterior at the vulva. So, up uh, it is communicating with the uterus and exteriorly there is vulva. It constitutes the excretory channel for the uterine secretion and menstrual blood. So, it is a channel, okay. This is like a passage. Uh, this vagina is acting like a channel for the uterine secretion which is nothing but the menstrual blood. It comes out through the vagina. It is an organ of copulation. So, uh, the uh, sperms travel high up into the uterus. It is organ of copulation and also the birth channel. Again, the baby is coming out from this baby is coming out from the uh, vagina. It acts as a birth canal for parturition. So guys, it's clear here. It is the, they are uh, mentioning about the functions here. One, it is the channel for the uterine secretion. Second, it is the organ of copulation. Third, it is forming a birth canal for parturition. Now, you can see the vaginal canal here. Okay. Uh, communicating with the uterus above and exteriorly there is vulva. The diameter of this canal is about 2.5 cm being widest in the upper part and it is narrowest at its enteroitis. Now, you can see the vaginal canal here. This vaginal opening is nothing but the introitus. It is narrower at its introitus, whereas it is wider in its upper part. It has got the enough power of distensibility as it is evident during the childbirth. So, this powerful distensibility, this uh, power of distensibility, you can witness this during the childbirth how wide it can get vaginal walls now we are going to study about the walls this vaginal walls have now you can see the vaginal canal it has an anterior wall posterior wall this anterior vaginal wall posterior vaginal wall and then the uh, side two are the lateral ones now you can see the anterior this is the posterior and then we have the lateral walls okay Moving on, uh, the anterior and posterior walls are opposed together and the lateral walls are comparatively stiffer. So, obviously, we saw there is the anterior and posterior, they are opposing each other. Whereas, the lateral walls are specif uh, stiffer specifically in the middle, okay. Uh, because of the stiffness, they are forming a H shape on the transverse section. Now, you take a transverse section of this and you observe the lateral walls, you can see the H shape, okay. The length of the anterior wall is 7 cm. This anterior wall, it is measuring about 7 cm. Whereas the posterior vaginal wall is 9 cm. Now you can see in the picture, 
this vaginal anterior vaginal wall measuring about 7 cm posterior vaginal wall 9 cm so guys you can see the anterior vaginal wall and this is the posterior vaginal wall 9 and this is 7 then what else do we have in the center it is a h shape okay fornices now you can see here the fornix these okay these projections are nothing but the fornix moving on let us see what they are talking the fornices are the clefts which are formed at the top of the vagina due to the projection of the uterine cervix into the vaginal vault so you can see the clefts which are formed in the top of the vagina this is the vagina now you saw this is the vagina anterior posterior wall this is continuing continuing it is forming clefts uh, with this okay this is continuing it is forming a cleft again it is forming a cleft these uh, extension these protrusion is nothing but the fornices oh, getting it so what they are saying these are the projection of the uterine cervix into the vaginal vault there are four fornices one anterior fornix one posterior fornix and the two lateral the posterior one is more deeper and the anterior one is shallower now you can see the cervix this is the vaginal fornix and then uh, we have the anterior fornix posterior fornix and two lateral fornixes now we move on to the next part that is the relation of the vagina with the other parts so to understand that let us uh, just know grossly this is the vagina so guys we know this is the vagina extending upwards and then this is the uterus anteriorly we have the bladder this is the bladder continuing there is the urethra main important things i'll tell you which we want Rele relevant anatomy will study okay let us ignore the rest parts uh, later on in the others, uh, other videos we can discuss when it's required so as of now you have to remember this uh, vagina we are going to discuss about it so anteriorly there is bladder urethra posteriorly we have the posteriorly there is rectum you can see the rectum here and then there is a perineal body and the pouch of douglas okay these things you remember rectum specifically anteriorly bladder posteriorly rectum relations anterior the upper one third is related with the base of the bladder so you can see here the vagina anterior there is base of the bladder and then the lower two third is with the urethra the lower half of which is firmly embedded with its wall so guys uh, from this picture very beautifully we understood this vagina this is the base of the bladder upper th upper part and the lower part it is related to the urethra bladder and the urethra the relation posteriorly upper one third is related to the pouch of douglas so you can see posteriorly there is pouch of douglas and the upper one third this is vagina upper one third now you're dividing the vagina into three parts so the upper one third is the pouch of douglas okay moving on and then uh, we have okay uh, the middle third with the anterior rectal wall separated by the rectovaginal septum so there is a rectal wall and this uh, middle third of the vagina is separated from the rectum by the rectovaginal septum rectum and vagina separated by the rectovaginal septum the lower third is separated from the anal canal by the perineal body so in this picture you can make out this is the vagina this vagina uh, from the upper one third we have the rectum and then we have the rectovaginal septum and then the lower third is by the perineal body okay hope it's clear moving on the lateral walls so we saw the anterior part posterior part so now let us see laterally on the vagina what are the structures what are the relations it's having 
the upper one third is related with the pelvic cellular tissues at the base of the broad ligament in which the ureter and the uterine artery will lie approximately 2 cm from the lateral fornices so guys you can see here in the upper one third it is pelvic cellular tissues okay and then uh, you can see the broad ligament at the base of the broad ligament so we don't have a picture of it in the next slides upcoming slides i'll show you so you have to remember laterally upper one third it is related to the pelvic cellular tissue and then in the middle third it is related to the levator nani and the lower third it is related to the bulbo cavernosus muscle vestibular bulbs and the bartholin's gland this lower third is very clear we have seen it in the previous slides the bulbo cavernosus muscle the vestibular bulbs and the bartholin's gland and then in the middle third we have the levator ani and upper third we have pelvic cellular tissues these are uh, which are situated at the base of the broad ligament okay so you can see here the bulbo cavernosus muscle and then uh, the layers from within outwards are the mucus coat which is lined by the stratified squamous epithelium without any secretory glands this mucus coat does not contain any secretory gland then we have the sub mucus layer of the loose areolar vascular tissues now you can see in the picture here the mucus coat which is having nothing it is just lined by the squa stratified squamous epithelium and then submucous tissue which is containing the loose areolar vascular tissues then moving on we have the muscular layer so this mus smooth muscle layer okay this smooth muscular layer is containing the inner circular and outer longitudinal muscles so inner we have circular okay circular whereas the outer are longitudinal and then fibrous coat it is derived from the endopelvic fascia it is tough so it is fibrous so fibrous is going to be tough and it is highly vascular this external fibrous layer being a highly vascular and whereas the muscular layer it has central uh, circular and outer longitudinal muscles epithelium the vaginal epithelium is under the action of the sex hormones at birth up to 10 to 14 days the epithelium is stratified squamous and it is under the influence of the maternal estrogen which is circulating still in the newborn the maternal estrogen is circulating and the vaginal epithelium is under the influence of this maternal estrogen up to 10 to 14 days of birth from puberty till the menopause the vaginal epithelium is going to be stratified squamous and it is devoid of any glands the distinct layers are basal cell intermediate cell and superficial cornified cells intermediate and the superficial cells will contain the glycogen and it is under the influence of the estrogen whereas the superficial cells will exfoliate constantly so guys you can see here this intermediate cells and superficial cornified cells they contain glycogen and this glycogen is under the influence of estrogen and the superficial cells will be exfoliating constantly from puberty till menopause when the epithelium is exposed to the dry external atmosphere the keratinization takes place and unlike the skin it does not contain the hair follicle sweat and sebaceous glands so guys we can see the epithelium of the vagina and then when the epithelium is exposed obviously the keratinization is going to take place and unlike skin the epithelium does not contain the hair follicles sweat glands and the sebaceous glands moving on the glands secretion vaginal secretion is very small in amount it is sufficient to make the surface moist the secretions is derived from the glands of the cervix the glands of the uterus and the transudation of the vaginal epithelium and the bartholin's gland during the sexual excitement so during sexual excitement what all the glands which are secreting the excretion uh, the secretions are coming from the cervix uterus 
and uh, from the transudation of vaginal epithelium and Bartholin's glands more specifically. The pH of the vaginal secretion is acidic and it varies during the different phases of the lives and the menstrual cycle. The conversion of the glycogen to the lactic acid is done by the daughter lines bacilli. So we are going to deal about this in the next slide. This daughter lines bacilli is converting the glycogen into the lactic acid. It is dependent on the estrogen. This is also done under the influence of the estrogen. As such, the pH is more towards the acidic during the childbearing period and it will range between 4 to 5.5 with the average of 4.5. So, average pH of the vaginal secretion is 4.5. It is acidic. Uh, what does it do? It uh, The conversion of the glycogen into the lactic acid is done by the daughter line bacilli which is resulting in the acidic pH. The vaginal secretion will consist of, so this secretion, what does it consist? It will consist the tissue fluid, epithelial debris, some leukocytes, the nerves, uh, the, the, uh, these leukocytes will never contain more than the occasional pus cells. So guys, you can see here, there is some leukocytes, but they do not contain much of the pus cells. The pus cells are very rare. We also have the electrolytes, proteins and lactic acid and the epithelial uh, epithelium debris and so on apart from the daughter line bacilli it contains many pathogenic organisms including the cl clostridium welchi the glycogen content is highest in the vaginal fornix we saw the vaginal fornix the clefts so these clefts will contain the highest glycogen okay so i hope it's clear the secretion is containing what the secretion contains and uh, the other organisms which are present here the pathogenic organisms are clostridium welchi and the glycogen content is highest in the vaginal fornix now we saw the daughter lens bacillus uh, what is daughter lines bacillus it is a rod shaped gram positive bacillus which grows anaerobically on the acid medium. It appears in the vagina 3 to 4 days after the birth and it will disappear after 10 to 14 days. It appears again at the puberty and it will disappear after menopause. So it is coming, going so many times. So you can see here again, it is gram positive. Okay, this is positive, gram positive. It is obviously rod shaped. And then it is coming 3 to 4 days after birth. It is going away after 10 to 14 days. Again coming at puberty, going back after menopause. So daughter lines bacilli is done. No, we still have about it. It is probably coming from the intestine. Its present is dependent upon the estrogen. So daughter lines bacilli present if its presence will be dependent totally on the estrogen and the and what is the function of the daughter lens bacillus is just to convert the glycogen present in the vaginal mucosa into the lactic acid because of this conversion the vaginal ph will be maintained towards the acidic side why is the vaginal ph acidic it is because uh, it is going to prevent the other pathogenic organisms from t uh, growing it becomes a source of the medium since the part is always moist it can become a source of a medium for the microorganisms to grow so to prevent the growth of the pathogenic microorganisms the daughter lines bacilli make sure that the vaginal secretions are acidic and the ph is 4.5 the blood supply uterine artery vaginal artery middle rectal artery we also have the internal pudendal artery. These arteries will anastomose with each other and they form two azygos arteries anterior and posterior. The veins will drain into the internal iliac and internal pudendal veins. So guys you can see the arteries here. Ovarian, uterine, vaginal. Okay. Okay I don't know what was wrong with this. It's continuing. Okay sorry there's some problem okay we're going to continue so we're done with all this uh we were in the blood supply okay done Nerve supply, vagina is supplied by the sympathetic and parasympathetic form of plexus, uh, pelvic plexus the lower part will be supplied by the pudendal nerve so you guys you can see here 
it is by the pelvic plexus and lower part by the pudendal nerve now we are going to deal with the uterus now we are done with vagina moving on to the uterus what is uterus it is a hollow piriform piriform is a pear shaped muscular organ it is situated in the pelvis between the bladder in the front and rectum behind so guys we know we have the bladder and the urethra this is bladder and the urethra then we have the uh, vagina and the uterus and then behind we have the rectum so we know this already from the previous slides so again just a quick revision we have the uterus and anteriorly bladder and the urethra posteriorly rectum the normal position is one of the antiversion and anti flexion so the normal position is going to be antiversion and anti flexion so what do you mean by antiversion here antiversion means the long axis of the cervix to the long axis of the vagina it is about 90 degree you can see the angle of antiversion here antiversion this is the angle what's happening the long axis of the cervix is related to the long axis of the vagina okay long axis of the vagina with the long axis of the cervix sorry uh, this angle i'm sorry you can see long axis this purple color of the vagina with the long axis of the cervix this angle is antiversion then we move on to the next angle that is anti flexion in anti flexion we have the long axis of the body of the uterus and the long axis of the cervix this is the long axis of the uterine body and the long axis of the cervix which is forming an angle this angle is anti flexion okay so normal position is anti inverted and anti flexed moving on the measurements in the parts of the uterus the uterus measures about 8 cm long 5 cm wide at the fundus and its walls and are about 1.25 cm thick its weight will vary from 50 to 80 g so guys this part okay above the fallopian tubes this part is the fundus of the uterus and it is about what is wide the measurement 5 cm wide at the fundus the thickness of the walls is 1.25 cm weight of the uterus if they ask you have to say it's 50 to 80 g then the uterus it, uh, the parts are body or the corpus now you can see here the body or the corpus and then we have the isthmus and cervix the body is further divided into fundus the part is which is lying above the openings of the uterine tubes so above the opening of the uterine tubes we have the fundus and then the body is properly a triangular and it is lying between the openings of the tubes and the isthmus so guys you can see here the body which is lying between the uterine tubes and below we have the isthmus okay so it is forming a triangle here this is what they are saying this triangle the body properly is a triangular and it is lying between the openings of the tube so it is lying between the openings of the tubes and isthmus moving on the superior lateral angles of the body of the uterus will project outwards from the junction of the fundus and the body so you can see here these projections from the junction of the fundus now you can see the fundus and the body it is forming a junction here and these projections are nothing but the cornua of the uterus the fundus and the body which is forming a junction here and this protrusion out is nothing but the cornua of the uterus the uterine tube round ligament ovarian ligament are attached to each cornua you can see in the picture okay we have the round ligament fallopian tubes that is nothing but the uterine tubes and also the ovarian ligament which is attached to each of the cornua on either side we have the round ligament ovarian ligament and the fallopian tube isthmus 
Isthmus is a constricted part of uh, constricted part. It is measuring about 0.5 centimeter. Now you can see the isthmus here, which is measuring about 0.5 centimeter. It is obviously situated between the body and the cervix. Above we have the body, and below we have the cervix. It is in the junction between the body and the cervix. We have isthmus measuring about 0.5 centimeters. It is limited above by the anatomical internal os and below by the histological internal os. So guys, this isthmus they're talking about this uh, superiorly there is anatomical os and below we have the histological os it is limited okay this part is nothing but isthmus cervix the cervix is the lowermost part of the uterus it is extending from the histological internal os and it is extending at the external os which opens into the vagina so you can see the cervix here from the histological os it is extending and opening into the external os it is opening in the external os okay this is cervix measuring about 2.5 centimeters it is cylindrical in shape and it is measuring 2.5 centimeters in length and diameter it is divided into supravaginal part the part which is lying above the vagina and the part which is lying within the vagina is the vaginal part and each of these parts is measuring about 1.25 cm it is divided into equally into two supravaginal and intravaginal which is lying in the vagina and the, the other one is supravaginal in nulliparis the vaginal part of the cervix is conical and the external os is looking circular so we saw that os is circular and it is looking cervix is conical shape Whereas in the Paris women, the cervix is cylindrical and the os is like a bilateral slit. Okay. In the Paris women. Structures. The body of the uterus. The wall will consist of three layers from outside inwards. We have perimetrium. The outside layer, the perimetrium. It is the serous surcoat. Then we have the myometrium and endometrium. Myometrium muscle and endometrium which sheds out. So the myometrium is consisting of the bundles of smooth muscle fibers. They are held by connective tissues. They are arranged in various directions. So the myometrium is going to contain the muscle fibers. They are uh, supplied by the, uh, they are held with the connective tissues and they are arranged in the various directions. These muscles, circular, longitudinal. So they are arranged in various directions. Then we have the endometrium, the innermost lining. It is a mucus lining and it is called the endometrium. It is changed to decidua during pregnancy and it is shed during the each menstrual cycle. And the same endometrium is being turned into decidua during the pregnancy. Moving on to the blood supply of the uterus, the arterial supply is from the uterine artery. The other sources are the ovarian and vaginal arteries to which the uterine arteries are going to anastomose you can see the various arteries which are supplying the uterus here we see the artery side we have the ovarian artery uh, then we have the uterine artery and the vaginal arteries they are anastomosing uh, this is the uh, ovarian and vaginal are anastomosing with the anastomosing with the uh, ut uterine arteries the venous channels uh, will correspond to the arterial course and they are draining into the internal iliac veins so guys the venous channels of the uterus are draining into the internal iliac veins which can go with the further larger veins now you see the uterine of the fallopian tube so we are done with the vagina we are done with uterus cervix now we are going to deal with the fallopian tubes this part okay this fallopian tube fallopian tubes the synonym is also uterine tube they are paired structures they are measuring about 10 centimeters which is 4 inches so you can see the fallopian tube measuring about 10 centimeters and they are bilateral structures they are present on both the sides of the uterus each tube has two openings one is communicating with the ang lateral angle of the uterine cavity this is known as uterine opening and this opening is about 1 mm in diameter whereas the other opening on the lateral end of the tube it is the pelvic opening also known as the abdomen or it is the abdominal ostium and this opening is quite wider and the diameter is 2 mm okay 
now i i'll show you the opening here first opening uterine opening it is 1 mm in diameter then the other opening is the abdominal ostium okay this opening is quite wider it is opening into the pelvis abdominal cavity and then it is about 2 mm okay pelvic opening then the parts intramural measuring about 1.25 cm that is half inches in length and 1 mm in diameter then we have the isthmus the isthmus is almost straight and it is measuring about 2.5 cm so guys this isthmus is 2.5 cm it is almost straight then we have the ampulla ampulla is torturous part and it is measuring 5 cm so you saw here it is 2.5 and this is 5 this is 2.5 and this ampulla is 5 cm then we have the infundibulum it is measuring 1.25 cm 2.5 5 and this is 1.25 and the diameter is maximum in the infundibulum being 6 mm and then we have the fimbriae the layers uh, it uh, the structure the fallopian tube will consist of three layers that is serous layer muscular layer and again the mucous membrane which is thrown into the longitudinal folds what is the function of this fallopian tube it will transport uh, the gametes and then it will facilitate the fertilization and also for the survival of the zygote through its secretion okay from the ovaries the gametes the ovum is going to transfer and then come into the uterus and then it will obviously the sperms will come and it will facilitate the fertilization so for the it acts as a passage okay and then the survival of a zygote through its secretion so for the zygote to survive also the fallopian tubes help blood supply it is supplied by the uterine and ovarian artery so guys you can see the fallopian tube here being supplied by the uterine as well as the ovarian artery this uterine artery and the ovarian artery which is supplying the fallopian tube moving on to the uh, venous venous drainage it is through the pampiniform plexus into the ovarian arteries now you can see these pampiniform plexus uh, which are uh, going into the ovarian arteries oh sorry you, uh, ovarian veins we are talking about the venous drainage here so guys don't confuse we have the arterial supply uterine and ovarian uh, arteries and then we have the venous drainage pampiniform plexus into ovarian veins then we move on to the nerve supply it is derived from the uterine and ovarian nerves the nerves uterine and ovarian nerves tube is very much sensitive to the handling next we have the ovaries so we are done with the vagina cervix uterus fallopian tube now we're moving to the next part that is ovaries so the ovaries they are paired sex glands or the gonads in the females they are concerned with the germ cell maturation so you know in the ovary this is the ovary the primordial follicle uh, mature follicle graphene follicle and so on and the rupture and everything so all these maturation takes place in the ovary and also the steroidogenesis okay the function of the ovary each gland is oval in shape and it is pinkish gray in color and the surface is scarred during the reproductive period the measurement the ovaries measure 3 cm in length 2 cm in breadth and 1 cm in the thickness each ovary will present two ends one is the tubal end and other is the uterine end so you can see the ends of the ovaries this is the tubal end the tubal end and the other one is the uterine end the two borders mesovarium and free posterior border one is mesovarium you can see here the mesovarium and the other one is the anterior border this anterior border is visible in this picture and i'm going to show you the mesovarium from here okay this is the mesovarium and this is the anterior border these are the two borders and posteriorly it is free border okay free posterior anteriorly we have mesovarium uh, mesovarium and free posterior these are the borders now you can see the two surfaces medial and lateral surface the medial surface of the ovaries and this is the lateral surface 
medial surface this is towards the medial side and then the lateral side we have the lateral surface and the medial surfaces moving on uh, the we also have the two poles upper pole and the lower pole and the anterior border and the free posterior border and also have the mesovarium the structures ovaries consist of the outer cortex and the inner medulla these ovaries they consist the cortex and inner is the medulla outer cortex inner medulla now you can see the mesovarium here cortex during the reproductive period from the puberty to the menopause the cortex will be studded with the follicular structures these follicular structures will act as a functional units of the ovary during the phases of the development they will be related to the sex hormone projection uh, production and ovulation so guys you can see this cortex okay this cortex is containing this is the cortex now you can see this purplish this cortex it is studded with the follicular structures and then they are related to sex hormone production this cortex is related to the sex hormone production and ovulation the structures which are present in the cortex are primordial follicle mature follicle graafian follicle and then we have the corpus luteum primordial mature corpus luteum atresia of the structure now you can see this uh, atresia of the structure will result in the formation of atritic follicles the atritic follicle is nothing but the corpus albicans so there is atresia this mature corpus luteum it is degenerating atresia is taking place that is the absence and then absence of the structure will result in the formation of corpus albicans then we move on to the next part that is medulla so we are done with the cortex moving on to the medulla the medulla will contain the connective tissues few unstriped muscles blood vessels and nerves so the medulla is uh, containing the connective it is loose connective tissue unstriped muscles blood vessels nerves they are small collection of cells called as hyalus cells so in the medulla we have the hyalus cells these hyalus cells are homologous to the interstitial cells of the testis okay hyalus cells in the medulla of the ovaries it is homologous to the interstitial cells of the testis the blood supply of the ovaries arterial supply is from the ovary by the ovarian artery and a branch of the abdominal aorta venous drainage is through the pampiniform plexus to form the ovarian vein which drain into the inferior vena cava this ovarian vein is further draining into the inferior vena cava the inferior vena on the right side Uh, so we have so this ovarian vein it is extending and it is going into the inferior vena cava on the right side whereas on the left side we have the left renal vein so let us see in the picture the left ovarian vein draining into the left renal vein whereas the right ovarian vein it is joining with the inferior vena cava arterial supply ovarian artery uterine artery okay uh lymphatic is through the ovarian vessels will drain into the para aortic lymph nodes nerve supply sympathetic supply will come down along the ovarian artery uh, the sympathetic supply is by the t10 segment the ovaries are very sensitive to the manual squeezing so we are done with the ovaries with this we come to an end of the external as well as the internal genitalia i hope everything is clear uh, if you have any doubts please put it in the comment section and if you like my video hit the like button and subscribe